Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, December 16th, 2021, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested. Dot com. Hello, and welcome to, well, it's No Way Home Week, isn't it? It's it's the big, it's the biggest Marvel week in like two years, and I'm so glad to have my two friends and colleagues here, Jeremy Williams. Hi, Norman. I'm good. Hi, Jeremy. And Kishore Hari. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Kishore Bokeh Kishore. Uh, good to have you both here. Kishore, before we get started, I know you were gone last week, did you think that my representation of the Dickens Fair drive through accurately reflected the experience you and I went through. Yeah, you, you were a little gentle, I would say. It was not a great experience. Um, I actually made it into the Dickens Fair experience, and it was short, and everyone was super nice when we got down in there, and they were doing their best. It just, it, they just weren't set up for success, and it was disheartening to see it was a tech failure literally people with ipads and like uh wi-fi dropping out and uh inability of signal that really contributed a lot to the problem now period appropriate then <laughs> <laughs> they could have taken those food orders by pigeon uh well let's set everyone here and all our listeners up for success i'm sure a bunch of them a bunch of you out there are maybe planning to go to the movies see your friends and family certainly you know it's we're looking forward to to reuniting with some of our family for the, the holidays in the next two weeks or so i personally don't have spider-man no way home tickets uh tell me if I made the right decision, because we're going to start off with a, uh, a return to a moment of science. Last time, Kishore, you gave us an overview of the kind of where we were when days after the Omicron variant was first detected. You said, hold tight. There's still studies to, ha- to happen, research to do. We have held tight. Can I unclench? Uh, sort of. Uh, and I will say the most important data point referencing the question you asked is uh 98% on rotten tomatoes for Spider-Man No Way Home. So let's uh and you may want to buy those tickets. But in terms of Omicron, um there's good news and bad news and all sorts of stuff in the middle. Um I'll just start with the emerging evidence and then provide some really quick thoughts of what's ahead. Uh caveat that the current data are moving targets. They, things are changing rapidly, but we know a lot more than we did two weeks ago. And in two weeks from now, we'll know even more. It's going to be an iterative process and things are going to change. Um, so first of all, uh, the first uh, studies on vaccine effectiveness against symptomatic disease came out. Uh, and I say that really specifically, against symptomatic disease. Um, uh, so this is a notch below hospitalization or death. Uh, our immune system has multiple layers to protect against uh, this disease. There's uh, the neutralizing antibodies that uh, initially react and try to bind to the spike protein. There's memory B cells that stimulate the production of more antibodies to lock onto that spike protein. And then there's T cells, particularly killer T cells, which go around and just eat up the virus unto, uh, itself. Uh, the memory B cells and T cells take a little longer. Uh, to to kind of spin up their work. They take a few days where the neutralizing antibodies that circulate in your blood, the ones that are stimulated by by a vaccine or by prior infection, um, they tend to act uh, pretty immediately. But those levels decline over time. And so what they did was test, uh, issue a lot of results related to the test on how many neutralizing antibodies that we have and how effective they are against uh, the virus. So this is, again, symptomatic disease again. So two doses of the AstraZeneca virus vaccine, excuse me, 0% uh, effectiveness. So this is the same uh, vaccine type that the J&J model is. And so we haven't seen any uh, data about J&J particularly, but I would expect it to be similarly low. 
Uh, two dose Pfizer series was shown to be somewhere between 35% and 40% effective against uh, symptomatic disease. That's a 20 to 30 fold reduction in neutralizing antibody levels. A three dose Pfizer booster series was shown to be 75% effective. And there seem to be indications that the boost is providing you additional benefits beyond the booster in terms of long term immunity as well. But those studies were done in in the context of boosters that were recently received. So not boosters that were like three, four months ago. Uh, in very positive news, uh, I mentioned how the mutations affected like sites on the spike protein uh, two weeks ago. T cells can still bind to the, to the spike protein on the virus really, really well. So they will still annihilate the virus when they uh, find it. And then lastly, in the UK, where there is this today, 78,000 new cases uh, announced. Um, they said they released an analysis last Friday that showed 7% of the cases that they're finding currently are reinfections, people that had previously had uh, Delta and were reinfected by Omicron. Whereas with the Delta virus, uh, we only saw a 0.3% reinfection rate, meaning that a lot more people are susceptible to this virus than, uh, than with Delta. The doubling time, this is how long it takes to go from one case to two, to four, to eight. And those numbers get really big, really fast. In the UK, the doubling rate is 2.2 days to 2.6 days. That means things are accelerating at a, at a pace that is hard to wrap your head around. Um, in South Africa, it's closer to three days. In the US, it's about, uh, it's about three days as well. Is that faster um, than Delta? Yes, but um, only, but it's it's complicated because what we're doing here is measuring the effective rate of reproduction, which means with all the measures in place, people wearing masks, people having immunity, um, uh, the social distancing, uh, prior infection, you take that all into account. So Omicron and Delta in like in laboratory settings actually might be the same level of transmissibility, but Omicron in practice because it's evading prior immunity is is moving faster in the population. Um, so that doubling time is uh, coupled with the fact that the CDC released information that 3% of the cases they sequenced last week were Omicron, means that this thing is coming fast. That means this week it's probably already at 6% of the cases. Probably by before the end of the year, it will be the dominant virus circulating in the US. And it's moving. I would say within 10 to 12 days, uh, Omicron is going to be the dominant uh, variant, and there are models and projections that show will be like close to a million cases per day uh, come uh, in early January. That's how fast this thing is moving. We are on an exponential curve <clears throat> that is steeper than anything we've seen before. Uh, and this is backed up by the fact that we're seeing it in detection in wastewater in multiple cities, uh, and uh, it just how we're seeing. Uh, w uh, uh, some testing results, including in Seattle, uh, of uh, of indications of uh, of serious exponential growth. Now, on the good news side, disease severity. This is a really hard thing to manage uh, 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 to measure because disease severity is usually a lagging indicator from cases about three to six weeks, and it's barely been that amount of time since the initial breakout in South Africa. So it takes time for that infection to go from infection to hospitalization to the to potentially death. And we need to track those across age ranges, across like broad populations, because how do we know if it's just young people are recovering because young people tend to recover better from the virus at all versus something serious. But there's a lot of initial indications and mounting evidence day by day that Omicron introduces a less severe form of the disease. We have some early indications from studies that it's infecting, in, that it's the virus is replicating more in the brachia region, sort of like your upper respiratory tract, versus how Delta and other forms of SARS-CoV-2 replicated more in your in your lung. And when it replicated in the lung, it start, it, it could cause something called a cytokine storm, and your immune system goes nuts. And that's when things get bad and you start lose the ability to, to sort of keep oxygen and saturation in your blood, and you have to go on a ventilator. So this is a very good sign. Um, and so we need to see if this holds. We don't know. The, the rub here is that an increase in transmissibility, let's say this is twice as transmissible, and it's half as severe in terms of disease severity. 
those cancel each other out because twice as many people are going to get cases. So even if disease severity is down, we end up with the same overall number of cases. So the question that rem one of the big questions that remains is what is that disease severity? Is it half? Is it a fifth? Is it a tenth? We need to figure that out. And that's an open question that's being uh, that's being investigated based off of um, what we're seeing in South Africa, Denmark, Norway, and the UK. There are early indications that hospitalizations and ICU usage is 20 to 30 percent what it was in a similar time frame of a delta wave. These are very positive indicators, but it's too early for us to say this only causes mild disease. I think what we're largely, what's largely ahead of us is a lot of people are going to get this, and a lot of people are going to get this quickly. For most of us, I'm hoping that it's going to appear uh, like a something that uh, that comes quickly and fades within a couple days, uh, cold and flu-like symptoms, uh, and that we won't need to um, be hospitalized. For those of us that have boosters, we're going to be in a much better position because we may either get asymp asymptomatically infected, um, very minor uh, symptomatic infection, or just no infection at all. So I think um, that whole idea of like, go get a booster is more important now than ever before. Um, but I also think there's going to be some people that are more vulnerable. Um, they're immunocompromised, they're elderly. They're really susceptible still to this, even in its more mild, even if it's a milder state. And so we have to do everything we can to protect those, that vulnerable population. It means getting boosters out to no, nursing homes and still taking certain precautions where we can so that we protect all of our community and not just ourselves. Some real silver linings here. And this is early to say this, but I think I'm going to say it because I, I feel a sense of optimism coming. If Omicron does what it's starting to do, if it holds that it's milder disease, if it outcompetes Delta, we could be quickly in a place where Delta's gone. It just gets wiped off uh, by Omicron outcompeting it. We don't know if that's going to be the case, but we're seeing signs of that in the UK and South Africa. Then we're taking like the deadlier disease and knocking it out and to, to something that might be more manageable um, going forward. Uh, and so that actually could be. And it's it's way too early to to actually know. It could be a mean a very good spring for where we're going. We're going to have a tough month. Uh, a lot of people are going to get sick. A lot of people we know are going to get sick. Hopefully, they're just going to have mild cases and be able to to move on. Um, uh, but that's what's ahead. All right. Wow, that's a lot to take in. Uh, I took away the third shot goes from thirty to seventy percent in the Pfizer trials. That's that's a big takeaway. Yeah, and it offers additional protection beyond those neutralizing antibodies too. So we see, uh, get it now if you yeah. if you can. And um, this uh, idea of uh, you should wait like six months between your last dose. Like mm -hmm. we've already seen countries roll that back to four months or five months. That there's just mounting evidence that people should get boosters. We also have to address like the larger issue of vaccine equity around the world to prevent stuff like this from happening again. You had mentioned uh, Pfizer, but you didn't mention Moderna. Are we lumping those two in the same category? Uh, yeah, we, we roughly are. I didn't have a chance to read it, but Moderna released results this morning. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not going to comment on it because I haven't had a chance to uh, read it, but we would expect very similar findings. Uh, is there any update on the FDA's um, approval process for uh, children under five? Not that I have heard. Um, there is an update from the FDA, or well, from Pfizer, uh, about the their pill that uh, called uh, pa uh, Paxlovid, uh, which inhibits viral replication, and it's actually showing higher effectiveness against hospitalization. Uh, and death than they had originally reported. So I think you're going to see that fast tracked and try to be out to hospitals to help maybe too late for this wave, um, but out very in, in the spring. And that will do a lot to reduce the mortality rate from this. Yeah. So There's also ongoing questions about reprogramming the mRNA vaccine with new instructions for Omicron. There's a lot of debate whether that makes sense because it's too late for this wave. Like they can't make it in time, all of that stuff. Uh, but also you introduce some scientific questions about like evolutionary pressure you put on the virus to 
um, to mutate if you introduce a new strain? Who gets that? There's a lot of inequity and process questions that come up too. Ooh, all right. Uh, glass half full is that potentially, again, like you said, it's still to be determined. Severity could be lower just based on where we're at with hospitalization rates, where we're at in, in terms of this wave versus the Delta wave. That's that's like a that, that that's one degree. That's that's one one step away from like the, the the numbers actually we want to see. Um, and then also the treatment is potentially better with the Pfizer pill. But it doesn't help the immunocompromised who are also still the most vulnerable and this infection rate, which could be uh, or, or on that the hockey stick acceleration I, I curve. Think Largely for most of us, um, especially those that are younger, those that are vaccinated, those that have boosters, the outcomes for this are going to be um, uh, pretty positive. Uh, it's really about protecting those that are most vulnerable among us um, to make sure that we limit the number of deaths that we incur over the next um, month or two. Whew. All right. Well, it sounds like the next update we'll get from you probably will be in the new year because there probably won't be, you know, if there's, of course, if there's anything new next week, hopefully you can give us that info. But uh, hold tight for people who going back to the initial prompting of this, you know, Spider-Man No Way Home, Matrix Resurrections. Should I buy those tickets? What's what's my best strategy for this? I, I'll, I'll tell you this. I'm still going um, to visit family for the holidays. We're taking a road trip to see them. It's a little bit safer that way um but also like life has to keep going we can't live in a forever state of of lockdown for so many reasons and so we're going to take positive steps to ensure the protection of our loved ones that are immunocompromised and older and we did that in in part by getting boosters uh and then we're going to be smart um and so we're going to hunker down when we get there and watch a lot of christmas movies uh, I all apologies to uh, Matrix on IMAX. I think I might stream it, um, but you know I'm worried about that film being good. So, <laughs> but I I have a feeling I'm going to find a way to see Spider Man in a theater. All right. Well, I give your assessment of the situation 98 percent approval rating based on based on uh, 94 critics reviews. Yeah. Sure. Two uh, weeks ago, you told us to avoid the news for the next two weeks because they just wouldn't have the information. <laughs> I'm just going to keep avoiding the news and await your next update. <laughs> also avoid any anything about um, Spider-Man No Way Home. There's spoilers everywhere. Like, yeah. you can you can barely turn on the internet, so be careful. Uh, I have to jump, but uh, fare thee well, gentlemen. Thank you, Kishore. All right. We'll have uh, Kishore back next week. Jeremy, 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 I'm glad you're here with me because there's one other big topic I want to talk about this week. No, oh. there's so I mean, there's a bunch of other stuff, right? Like, uh, did I, ooh, you know, last week I got a new camera. I didn't get a chance to talk about that. But I don't know if that's worth talking about. What, uh, is it SLR? It's it. Oh, yeah. You know what? Let's let's talk technology. Um, let's do a little bit of tangent um, because. Great. Uh, I, I did want to talk about this camera. I'm using it right now, Jeremy. Oh. It, it is a um, – I bought this for a video specifically. So I'm still keeping my Canon 5D Mark IV that I got. That's five years old now. Still, I love that camera. That's my DSLR. It's, I need the, the optical viewfinder. I, 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 I love the quality of the images out of that. I'm used to it. I, I have all my controls memorized. I have lenses for it. So that's going to still be my uh, photo camera. And for the past year and a half, I had been using that 5D as my webcam. So all the podcasts you'd watch, you know, in the past year at least, uh, was using my full frame Canon 5D Mark IV with HDMI out, plugged into a Blackmagic mixer. And I think the quality was good. I, I think the video is, if you look at like just the recorded video out of that camera compared to you know, what we use at the office or our Sony cameras. It's great. You could tell it, it, it has bokeh, you know, the, the, it, it shows the full frameness, but there are a lot of things that are missing from video out of a DSLR that was designed primarily for photos and a five-year-old camera at that, right? You're, you're locked into um, H.264 recording, uh, 420 in terms of color depth. Uh, there's no picture profiles. Like you, what you get is a the the, M, the uh, MP4 you get out of the camera is going to be like aside from resolution and frame rate changes, 
and maybe like one or two compression settings, like there's not much you can do like the configure in the camera itself. And so I've been watching actually some of Joey's reviews and let's talking to Joey about it. And he loves the GH five. He's a, he's a big Panasonic fan. And I think Panasonic is one of the, the brands and the, the, the camera makers that maybe don't get as much attention in today's like Sony and Nikon uh, centric, you know, video camera world. Um, a lot of people love the Sony you know, a seven series. Uh, that's the the mirrorless full frame camera. Um, they just had the FX3 they launched earlier this year. It's you know very small full frame camera designed for video. A lot of people love the Blackmagic cameras, right? The pocket cinema cameras. Uh, but Joey loved the Panasonic GH5, which um, micro four thirds, and uh, the lens ecosystem is like there's tons of lenses, not so expensive, has a ton of video options. Uh, and then I was actually very strongly considering buying a GH5 Mark II, which was, it's basically the same camera, minor updates, uh, to get into that ecosystem. It would be stepping down from full frame, but I was okay with that. I, I think there are you know, debates about whether you need that full frame look all the time. Uh, and then as I was going to Best Buy or really like on Black Friday weekend, deciding, okay, I'm going to buy a GH5. I decided to watch a couple more reviews and say, oh, how much would it cost to go full frame? Because I really don't want to take a step back. And Joey actually reviewed a camera also from Panasonic, the S5, last year. And that's the one I ended up going with. Just long story short. It's it's a full no, frame. No, that was not short, Norm. That was not. That was a long story <laughs> long. You got the Panasonic S5? The S5. No one knows about it. Like the, It's not a camera that people people really know about. Uh, oh, I see a little puppy in the background, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah. Is puppy's that your puppy? Been, puppy's been delivered. Oh, my uh, goodness. Puppy's going to be with us for the rest of the podcast, and oh, puppy wow. may have some things to say. <laughs> so all right, all right. We'll, we'll just, we'll just <laughs> the, have to the pup, the, For people listening to the audio, the puppy has a cone of shame. Yes. But it's very cute. Yes. Very cute puppy. I'm distracted, almost. It's got two more um, days of cone of shame. So, so it, it's a full frame. Is it? It's not a video camera, though, is it? It's a, it's a, photo, it's a for photos, and you use it for it, videos just like the Canon? It is, they market it as a, uh, you know, form factor wise, a photo camera, yeah. but with lots of video features. Okay. Because like the Canon video, you know, like hooking it up to your computer in order to do live streaming, that was kind of a, a hack by Canon that they sort of released as a firmware update way late after their, their cameras were released. Yeah. Is, is this new camera, is that, that apparently that ships with this feature? Is it any better? Uh, I, well, I use HDMI port. Okay. So w w this, like the GH5 has, H the, this unfortunately, this one's micro HDMI. If I use micro HDMI, I'm powering it over USB-C. Uh, but one of the best things about this, and see if I can figure out the features. Oh, look, I'm, I'm already, you see my screen has changed a little bit. I can change color profiles. And this is a thing that I never really had a chance to do with that Canon camera, is change Exactly like the way the the camera records video. Let me move my microphone just a little bit further away, so it can bake in, you know, some contrast or have a very flat. So this is a flat vlog profile, and so at like 100 megabits per second, I can yeah. apply a, a LUT in this in Premiere, my editing software, and you know, and and it's I can bring out more detail in it because I'm filming in uh, like a 422 color depth. And you know, or I could do something right. like standard, vivid, you know, natural. What I like, like a seven oh nine, which is a more cinematic. Uh, I want to get to. Okay. There it goes. There so it this, goes. There it goes. This is your yeah. new live streaming rig. Like this is what you've got. This is what you bought it for primarily. No, well, I bought it to film video. Uh, okay. To film video at home. Okay. Yeah, and I'm also using it as my live streaming rig. But I don't have to now set up my DSLR uh, as my as my primary a camera and it's it has amazing stabilization the the thing that doesn't do very well uh is autofocus the continuous autofocus because it uses contrast based autofocus yeah so i it mentioned it that. to you last week and, it, and i've yeah. noticed it this week again can you not turn that off i can turn that off i can i can do manual okay. focus okay but any autofocus that it does in video will be uh because it's contract based the, it's not phase detect doesn't use phase detect pixels it needs to do the bouncing back and forth the little yeah. the wobble so yeah. it can it can see what's in focus zero in yeah yeah uh but it's a l mount and uh, i'm using the kit lens 20 to 20 to 70 
a millimeter kit lens. I actually like that can go much wider than my the other ones. Ooh, so here's a, a little bit of a wider, a wider look. Huh. Yeah. Really nice. Uh, really happy. Very happy for with you. it. I know you and, love um, cameras. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of my videos I'll be shooting with, and it's light enough that will fit on my slider, my motorized slider that I really nice. like. Yeah. Uh, and, and a monopod rig. So a lot of what I film at home is just with a monopod, and with a I can't put a big giant, you know, five pound camera with a big full frame lens on that. So this one, a little bit more compact um, and the videos I'll be shooting next year will all be with this camera. I don't have any new tech to share, but I did do a project recently <clears throat> that I'm going to, it's a, it's a Christmas present for my stepdad. Mm. So if he's listening, Merry Christmas. I'm sure he's not after your, your camera <laughs> monologue, but thank you. I, <laughs> what, what it is, is a, uh, I made it on the Glowforge. And first of all, I've been using the Glowforge since I got it. How long ago was that? Two, three years? A oh, while. More than that. More it's a than long that. time. Yeah. I, I'm not sure I've really ever cleaned those lenses. So, right. Really? So I, I got like the Zeiss wipes and I cleaned them down and it, they literally came off brown. Like, you know, and then I like multiple times. So, and thankfully that solved a problem I was having, which was it wasn't cutting all the way through the wood unless I boosted the power levels. So yeah. Couldn't have been good for anybody, but um, it's it's a, uh, I, he's a, he's living somewhere. He's not... Um, really able to use a TV remote anymore. He's he's getting a little older, and he uh, is frustrated because he just feels like he can't, you know, control what's on TV or, or really do much with it. So I made him a Raspberry Pi that's going to be filled with all these movies that he likes, and it's going to be hooked up to the TV, and it just is going to loop like live TV through everything, all these movies and TV shows that he likes nonstop. And it's going to be like a TV station with no commercials that only plays things that you like. And the one thing, because you, know, you can't control it, I'm calling it like the tough luck TV. But <laughs> what you can do is there, there's a remote control that you can press the button and it will just automatically play something else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it stops the current movie and it plays another video at random with the try your luck button on the, uh, on the tough luck TV remote so control. The idea is you you can't change you can you can't change channel manually. You can't restart. No, there's no, no scrubbing. Tough luck. It's the old. It's like it's like the experience of an old you know analog television where you're getting you're, you're the right you you're the TV station exactly. You put a a local broadcast TV station with the licensed films that you have into a box, and the only thing you can do is press that button to start something new at random. Call it changing channels. But magically, every time you change a channel, it's starting something from the beginning. That's the that's the experience that I don't know. That's the that's that's where I would maybe want a different experience. The channel surfing. You want to go to the middle such <laughs> that and, and and you know that little tiny TV that I did a, a review of? Um they their software, and it's really clever the way to do this, is you know, it'll, it'll index whatever media files you have, yeah. right? Uh, so you can put as many as if it's an SD card. The moment you turn it on, it starts a time code counter, right? Right. So so start it'll start zero it'll count, and then if you change channels, quote unquote, so you're swipping, uh, launching an, a separate video, it'll jump to that time code in that video, yeah, as if it was playing in the background right. all along. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know. I, I This is my present. I'm going to do it my <laughs> way, and we'll just see how it goes. I, I think this is going to be better than the current situation. And it was cool because I, I had, I'd never done this before, like the, the Raspberry Pi video looper software. It, it yeah. doesn't, like, the only the way that it's set up to skip is that you hit the K key on a keyboard, and I wasn't gonna like give him a keyboard and say this is your skip button. So I made this thing, and it, and it has like a a feather in it, like Adafruit's version of like the the you know an Arduino, but like a modern version of that, a microcontroller, and it it uh it can act as a Bluetooth low energy keyboard. So it, it does that. It, it now it pairs to the Raspberry Pi, and it it does it that way. I thought that was cool. I've never done. I've never made a fake keyboard before, so that was that was interesting. But you're literally hard coding just the K key. Yeah, exactly. Like it, it, the, the, the software is still receiving it as a keyboard letter K key. Exactly. Okay. Just, like, just like a main machine, you know, you get your, your arcade button, you put it into a board, and yeah. you're basically just, each of those buttons are being associated with a keyboard because you've got, you got to pass it through, you know, PC software. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Very cool. I hope he, uh, hope he enjoys it. Uh, and I may have the, 
ask you later about you know some uh, some help with uh, the the project I want to do, which would be having a TV, ha- having the channels play right all at the same time, so you get the experience of. You know, I'm changing channels, but I'm, I'm I, I changed it and I I swap back to exactly the moment where I want to see the scene in the other movie. Right? You know, don't you remember that when you were a kid? You're like, yeah. ooh, I'm I'm doing the 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 uh, the micromanagement of commercials. It was where I'm switching between the channels during the commercial break, but I know exactly when to switch back to not miss my favorite scenes. Yes, it was more about skipping the commercials than skipping parts of the movie. Yes, 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 yes totally yes, get that. Yeah, yeah. Kids, kids don't have that these days. The, kids today, too much, too much video on demand. Too much swiping. Swiping right or swiping left, whatever whatever it is. Hey everyone, Norm here. Before we continue, I want to let you know that this week's episode of This Is Only a Test is made possible with support from ITPro.tv. Start or grow your IT career with online IT training from ITPro.tv. Did the recent ransomware attack on the gas pipeline catch your attention? It's another example of how cybersecurity professionals are in demand. There are more than 500,000 open cybersecurity roles, and you can become a cybersec pro with online training. It's never too late to start a career in IT or move up the ladder, and ITPro.tv has you covered, from CompDIA and Cisco to EC Council and Microsoft. ITPro.tv has nearly 6,000 and hours of on-demand training and engaging hosts who present who present information in a talk show format. They're live every day and shows go studio to the web in 24 hours. Courses are conveniently listed by category, certification, and job role, and stream ITPro.tv courses live and on-demand worldwide via Roku, Apple TV, PC, or their iOS and Android apps. Learn IT, pass your certs, and get a great job with ITPro.tv. Visit ITPro.tv slash test to save 30% off all plans. That's ITPro.tv slash test. Once again, ITPro.tv slash test. Now back to the show. Uh, okay, the, the the real tech story, the big one I want to talk about, it was something that came out. We, we actually loosely talked about this last week. Um, it was a Matrix-related tech demo that they tease the unreal engine tease ahead of the game awards and it was debuted it laid you launch at the game awards you probably have seen this many of you probably have experienced it but it's a full ue5 unreal engine 5 tech demo called the matrix awakens it's free right now on all the next gen consoles the playstation 5 the xbox series x and even the xbox series s not for pc uh, I probably will not come out ever for PC, and we should discuss why that that may be the case. Um, Jeremy, I assume you've had a chance to try this tech demo. Yeah, uh, we want to describe it and, and what the experience is like. Uh, well, it starts out um, with some video footage of of Keanu Reeves talking to the camera, and then it kind of transitions to a CG Keanu Reeves, and and back again, and then sort of switches back and forth as he enters into the Matrix, and he talks about. Um, what is real and what isn't real, and um, eventually he ends up in a uh, in a car in a city fully CG'd with um, uh, Trinity. What's her name? Carrie Ann Moss. Yep. And uh, they drive, and then they sort of get self referential, and they drive around talking about you know needing the the the, the marketing people <laughs> were happy with this like you know mumbo jumbo about what is real, but then they also wanted a sexy car chase, and so then they do that, and they. It's all unreal powered at that point. And um, it it's it's you know, it's a marketing piece both for the Matrix and for Unreal Engine 5. And uh, eventually it just becomes a tech demo. It's this glorious car chase, but then it, it lets you take control and it shows off some of these elements of the engine that you can toggle, turning them off and on. This like this level of detailed geometry feature that they have, the audio settings, I mean say the, the real-time audio filters. Um, you know, obviously there's all kinds of ray tracing and beautiful graphics and, uh, and it's, uh, basically like a city that you can walk around in and drive, drive around in and sort of, uh, you know, it, in, interact with this interactive tech demo, which, uh, I found, I found, you know, having seen the Unreal Engine 5 initial demo, which was more like a Tomb Raider kind of experience, uh, this, this was, you know, beautiful and interactive and more or less what I expected. But I just want to say like from, I think most people's point of view, the human 
stuff, the, hum- the facial expressions and seeing people talking, that does not look real yet. And, and I feel like they wanted it to, uh, you know, and that's, that still is not there. And that makes me happy because that means that there's still technical advances to be made. There's things to look forward to. There's still very much an uncanny valley to CG human faces, no matter how good the scanning is. The macro yeah. level stuff, the cityscape, the the cars, the deformations that they can do, the the live audio effects that are being done. I mean, these buildings, every single window in every one of these skyscrapers is transparent, and you can see into these buildings. And there's some cool effects being done in order to to achieve that. But it is fantastic. It is a far far advanced from anything you know from a grand theft auto that we've seen before that kind of game and the macro level stuff is fantastic like when you're zooming back and you're doing you know man-made objects and buildings and cities and environments you know with tons of ai characters that is amazing and it's a great tech demo for that and i love first of all that there is a tech demo for kids today because we don't get those so much anymore like, you know, I, when I was in college, we, I was downloading demos from the demo scene and watching these kind of things. This is very much like a, a demo in the traditional sense of like you can like toggle the tech features and see what they're called and turn them off and on. And you can see all the triangles that the world is built from. You know, they remove the textures. And so I, I love that people are getting a taste of that because that's exciting to people who own who bought hardware and want to know what it's doing you know not just play the games but actually like or get a little bit into the the tech of it um yeah. so i love that that exists i just i just think that uh like the human stuff isn't quite there and the macro stuff is is and that looks great that's interesting uh i'm, I'm glad that your perspective you're coming from it not with the hyperbole that i was talking about it with so all my friends everyone because this blew me away this really? absolutely blew me away. And reading more into it, um, it one that it's for a free thing, like that Epic. Of course, they have unlimited money with you know licensing Unreal as well as Fortnite, right? That they could put a fifty to seventy person team, development team, which they consider small. That I would say that, like, you know, as a game developer, that's a that's a still a reasonably big, like a medium sized development company. They had, they had a fifty to seventy person team working on just this demo as a way to showcase unreal engine 5 and props to them because if you remember you know the, the when the first matrix came out i think it there was, was they they outsourced it to coalition studios so they're they're a microsoft team that uh, uh, for ep- optimizations right uh but like you know they they they, they had us you know that it was still a relatively small team from what i understand in, in 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 epic itself okay uh by design because they wanted to show that small teams can leverage a real engine and use things like procedural generation right. in their uh, the 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 world editor yeah. um, to to generate that city map right yeah. and then do some hand 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 uh, hand tune that I was it. talking about this with with Mike Micah at work and he and I I we made that that point is that like Ratchet and Clank looks incredible but it took a massive team and a massive amount of effort in order to achieve that whereas Unreal Engine five seems like it will offer the same many of the same kind of features to smaller teams just by virtue of using the engine and and the libraries like the tools itself they have to make epic had to make the tool for city building right it's not like right. you could do a, a science fiction environment in the same way their their world engine allows for maybe things like terrain uh, as well as city stuff and then pulls from a library of assets that you use as a foundation so your art team can do the the fine tweaking of the freeways or or whatever um just like the context of of tech demos in general and and the matrix being the matrix franchise having this parallel growth with both the visual effects you know industry and the innovations it made pioneered there as well as the rise in consumer based graphics technology there's like these rising parallel trends whereas matrix 1 came out blew our minds. ILM did some amazing innovations to make that happen with bullet time, with some CG humans, right? Some of the Agent Smiths were, were CG. And, and um, at the same time, we had some amazing PC graphics demos at the same time. But back then, do you remember it was 3D Mark who kind of ripped off the Matrix scene and and jumped on the, and, and, and kind of um, uh, in 3D Mark, was it 2000 or 1999? It must have been 3D Mark 1999 
as a benchmark, one of the scenes was the Matrix uh, lobby scene. Yeah, with the destructible columns and and uh, you know they had a protagonist that looked just like Neo in yep. sunglasses doing martial arts, but it wasn't Matrix branded at all. It was just ooh, this is a popular action thing. Max Payne came out just around that time with similar yeah. bullet time moves, uh, and so there was not wasn't that like a kind of corporate synergy. Obviously, in today's age, Unreal, Epic, and uh, the uh, the the lead uh, creatives there coming from that same background as ILM team who worked on the first Matrix got ahead of it got in touch with Warner Brothers that's how they got the assets to literally get this as a license promotion for Matrix Resurrections but also they were able to pull the original art assets from the first Matrix so they could recreate Neo waking up and getting the message on his computer that's what this demo opens with the yeah. full CG representation of his um, of his home apartment. When he's asleep and he's dreaming about, you know, what is the Matrix? Uh, same with that. They, they do recreate the rooftop bullet time sequence, the one where he, he's leaning back and, and the, the agent is shooting. And apparently that is using some of the same um, source assets from the first Matrix film. Okay. But when you say they recreate it, it doesn't yeah. look like the movie. Like you no. can you can tell that this is a video game engine. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and and they, you're. I think you're right that they really tried the metahumans. Is there a technology for like CG humans, which can scale from just NPC characters to as much detail and and rigging and animation as the Carrie Ann Moss and the Keanu Reeves representations in this game. Like Keanu goes right up to the virtual camera and like ask the viewer on their xbox on their 4k tv to say are you cg or are you not and i think you're right like there is an uncanny valley there there's a smoothness it, i think it looks better than the cyberpunk representation of keanu reeves it looks better than like 99 percent of the real-time characters i've seen in any video game for sure and they had full body scan keanu for that but when he looks into the mirror and talks to the the modern day keanu yeah right that's video mm -hmm. And there, that's there where you can say, okay, wow, even with the film grain applied, video is video. Videos, they have not reached that level of, you know, uh, of realism as what you can still capture with. with they video. haven't even reached the realism in the shirt he's wearing. Like there yeah. is a long way to go. And, and great. Like that, that's, I'm happy about that. <laughs> For one, that means, okay, uh, there's not going to be any like real time deep fakes in the near future. So that's good. But, but Defix is video, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. But it's just like, I like watching this wave happen. And the the fact that we still have generations of advancements to look forward to in real-time graphics before we get to photoreal, before we get to something that is indistinguishable from reality, that's great. That's yeah. when it comes to humans, when it comes to organics. And, and you notice in that scene, it's there's nothing else that's rendering. It's using all the processing on one character yeah uh which means there's a lot to grow in terms of compute and, yeah you know not just engine optimizations but you're not going to put a dozen of those keanus at that level or better of fidelity uh in any real-time representation or engine or game or whatever anytime soon i would love to hear from people in the film industry who have worked on you know some of the human uh you know de-aging or yeah. completely CG humans that have fooled people, and I would like to know like what they th what they project the timeline is for real time to catch up, and what type of advancements are needed because that's it's clearly like on it's clearly in the future because it can be done offline. So I'm curious what how long until it takes to get real time. And, and there's a difference between real time with a locked camera and real time with player controlled camera right like a third person or first person camera yeah right at some point the next step is going to be as maybe as good as what we see in the movies but a locked cinematic camera so you can't manipulate it and maybe you can turn some effects on and off and that's cool as a tech demo but that's not freedom of control that you want in real time the point of real time is interactivity and a locked camera is not interactive yep um and then the second part of the demo uh, i actually found was I, I agree with you was maybe the more impressive part the car chase so one the car chase f happens in that rendered city it's not like they segmented out a piece of the freeway it's in the very city that they generated so the whole city is being rendered at the same time as the car chase um 
And it has the uh, what they call the, the chaos engine for physics, the Unreal Engine physics. So anytime an agent smashes into a car and deforms it, or the car explodes and flips, that is not a scripted animation. It is them nudging the car in a certain way and letting it hit a solid wall and then letting it bounce. Uh, and you can see the frame rate dip, at least on the, I had it on the Xbox Series S hmm. here at home. And... Uh, it's, so you, you, know some, amazing. you know some math must be involved. Well, yeah, math absolutely involved. And that's that's where the hard work is. And that's where you see the limitations, I think, of this demo, where they're cheating. Like they're showing you as much as they want to show because they're not doing real-time collisions on any of the other traffic that's going on. Right? That's us AI running its scripting. Um, they're narrowing all the the yeah, the physics compute just to this this freeway scene. And also the, the there's an amazing bullet time finale of that scene. And that's done, done in real time. That's where the sound also is, I think, really, really amazing. Uh, they do introduce this new character, Io, uh, in this that, that you play as, 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 uh, as the lead in this. And I think the idea, the, one of the reasons that it's not on PC as a tech demo is probably because they don't want to have the full assets of Keanu Reeves and Carrie Ann Moss for anyone to use in a tech demo to download. They probably don't have the rights to distribute that. The word is they're going to be giving away, and this they may exclude the those stars, but they're giving away all the assets in this demo for game developers to use in whatever, however they want in their own games. So you yes. can use the city and the cars. And I think you can use this IO character. Oh, because interesting. Because that one is, is not licensed. That's a complete original creation by yeah. Epic using the MetaHuman technology. And so I think you're going to get the developers who get asked these assets, I think early next year, will be able to release a version of this minus the, the opening sequence with Neo's apartment and the Matrix right. scenes. And it'll be a generic, kind of like your Max Payne or 3 d Mark 1999, you know, Matrix-inspired tech demo. Um, so I, I thought car scene was fantastic. You know, it, it, it gave you a sense of, oh, okay, this is what a uh, an action shooter could look like in this generation with this type, this type of crazy yeah. physics. Um, and then the end, like there's a whole bit where you get to like toggle on the, the effects. And I found that interesting from a just tech perspective. Right. But then the end, it gives you this kind of GTA like open world exploration aspect where you could walk around that world. And here's where I was like of two minds. One, I was like, this is beautiful. This world they've made, right? The the reflections, the the global illumination, the number of pedestrians. It feels as populated as like Spider Man on PS4 and PS5. That it's not as big as that New York, like this this little downtown area. But you know, I've seen people post their own cinematic cuts of the their fly throughs of this world, or or their you know uh, in game photography. And some of this stuff just looks just the stills, the screenshots look photoreal from certain perspectives. Mm -hmm. like the, the high gloss reflections on the on the cars and the puddles and the street signs. Like from certain angles, it looks like a really, really polished, you know, CG representation of a of a major metro a metropolitan city. Yeah. Uh you mentioned the the skyscrapers, right? And how the their windows yeah. is, and you can look in. Spider Man did a similar thing. So that's not real geometry. No, I know. That's it's behind a shader. It. It's, it's, a, it's it's a shade right. It's it's just like it's just doing math because like the rooms are all boxes and it's looking at where your perspective from your camera is looking through that plane of a the rectangle of a window and then just kind of drawing the lines you know where where uh it would be where your perspective would change to it, give you a sense of parallax it does so much to feel to make that world feel real you know yeah. for me walking through especially well in both the um spider-man and also this you know just it's like it's one thing to get those buildings erected but i'm so used to seeing you know textures in place of windows or maybe you know might they might be shiny but yeah, they're yeah, still yeah. they're still just textures and so to be able to see through them it creates the sense of depth and immersion that i i really appreciate well it not just the 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 depth of it moves when you move past them but light also affects yeah. it and they illuminate too mm -hmm. right so there's all these kind of tricks because when you toggle that geometry it really is just a flat flat wall with with the you know certain panes having having yeah. that shader there was some question as to whether like how they're doing that there's clearly a shader involved in that window in order to make it look uh you know warbly like it's uh um what do they call that effect on glass where it looks like you know like water mm -hmm. uh, but it's yeah. like it diffracts the the light yeah, um, there was some question at work as like whether or not there is geometry beyond that 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 may be replicated across all of the windows or something like that. 
Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know, but it, it it's definitely it's definitely impressive, and whatever they're doing is is worthwhile. It's a cool trick. The the neat thing about the engine, from my standpoint, and I've never worked with Unreal, but it would I I feel like this is a great time to for indies to get into it because this feature of the dynamic geomet- uh, geometry level of detail you know a reduction that they have going like they've they've decided they've figured out how many polys is needed in order to represent sort of like a realistic world you feed this engine whatever models you want and it it deconstructs them dynamically based on how far away from the camera they are based on how much detail is required and it will as you get closer to them it, it automatically fills in the gaps it's the streaming not, aspect of geometry, right? It's the the, 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 the yeah. nanite engine they talk about. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And so you don't it, you don't need to like feed it multiple level of detail models. You don't need. It's not, not like you need to worry about you know like texture mip mapping like they used to do. It's just like this. You can feed it movie assets, and it just deconstructs and uses what it needs. So it's like that. That to me is <laughs> that seems like a humongous time saver. And interestingly, yeah. it could potentially be future proofing too. Because all that detail is sort of all the, the geometry is in the in the game in the data file. If we get to PlayStation Six, the next Xbox, and we can you know apply more power to displaying those models, it would it would have the data. And but that's just these are static models. I think it's an important thing because just like the 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 geological terrain of that Tomb Raider S demo mm-hmm. they showed that had like this infinite view distance. And yeah. they talk about how this Nana engine allows everything to be rendered. Uh, every, you're, you're basically, you have infinite view, the level of detail dynamically streams in, um, but it's always showing the full map at once. Uh, there's no pop in right in, in, the, in that way. Uh, and here it's the same tech, except now applied to an urban landscape. But what's similar, and, and I think thinking of that mountain terrain as analogy is a better analogy, is that it's static in the same way that mountain you don't expect the the rocks to to collapse, and you have to add an extra you know physics, and that's why it's only a limited number of cars in in this demo that can that um, that have the explosions. Uh, you can't blow out the windows; the buildings aren't going to fall. It really is you know the is a it's just a, a fixed. Uh, city right. in, in terms of the the quote unquote geometry of it, um, the AI was really neat. They talked about how there are you know thirty forty thousand cars and twenty thousand pieces of AI, and 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 I'd say it's like still feels a little bit current gen or last gen in terms of like their their behavior. Certainly, if you have, you have like it's not it's not uh, rock star levels of animation, right? They're not doing hand. Hand uh, sculpted, you know, perform motion cap for for all the characters, like like in a Red Dead. Um, but they talk about how they're tracking everything all the time. In a lot of the old games, you see this in you know PS3 games and Xbox 360, and even Xbox One games, where you're looking at a city, you turn away. It's not not only is it not visually pushing rendering the pixels of what's behind you, but it stops calculating the AI, AI behind you. So you can spin around through 360 and suddenly, you know, the, the AI is different t-shirt. It's a different, different character completely. They're just yeah. dropping people in here. They're tracking all those unique AI characters and cars. Always. The only thing they do when you're, it, it's not about your, what's in front of you. It's about how far things are away from you. There's like a radial, um, dispersal, of of, of um, of detail where the AI that's further away from you is still being tracked, but they update that AI less frequently. So only the AI that's closer to you gets the smartest AI, I guess, which is a, a neat way of, of doing, you know, level of detail, you know, as for, for AI uh, while still tracking everything. I wonder how that ties into the engine. I don't think of AI as being an engine feature. So that's, that's interesting. I wonder how that's done from a scripting standpoint or from a coding standpoint. Yeah, uh, something also interesting, like you know, rendering because a lo- lot of games they don't render native, right? Most games, if you want stable frame rates, if you're pushing the the engine to the max, they're going to be doing some type of type of a scaling. And you notice uh, in this demo, it goes to to letterbox view um, for for some of the action scenes, and not only does that make it a more cinematic look at that twenty one nine aspect ratio. Uh, but they can also then do a, a, they can render fewer pixels. And so, you, you know, and they're doing, I think some of that at 24 FPS as opposed to 30, just to give it the more cinematic look as well. So yeah. their targets, targets were lower and they don't have to do a full 4k, 
uh, 4K render. I don't think any of the scenes are actually rendered in in true 4K. Hmm. Um, and I think one of the real developers said, uh, in terms of you know, we hear about the streaming data, the fast SSDs of these consoles are the things that enable this. Uh, they said that each scene pushes out about uh, 10 megabytes per frame of data is what they're streaming. So if you extrapolate that, that to you know 30 frames per second, uh, every second it's about 300 megabytes of I/O coming from um, from storage to I, uh, to to VRAM. That doesn't make sense. Like if I'm sitting still at a stoplight, you're telling me I'm getting 10 megs a second of new yeah. data. Uh, uh, Maybe at max. I don't know if it's dynamic. If uh, uh. if you're if you're not moving, but okay. uh, yeah, that, that's that's what they you know. And, and if you think about PC SSDs, maybe this is another reason why they didn't just want to put this out on SSDs. We may have GPUs, you know, the the RTX cards and the ray tracing that we can, right. but not everyone's going to have the same um, I/O uh, throughput for their SSDs if they're on spinning drives, and they they didn't optimize for for slower drives. It's an impressive demo. I hope the movie's good. <laughs> I don't. At this point, I, I like I separate the movie from the tech demo. I'm happy that the movie exists because one, I want to see the movie, and I do think the movie is going to be good. But go. I'm also happy the movie exists because it allows Epic, you know, the opportunity, this moment to put out this, I think, pretty amazing demo. Even if the movie isn't good, it'll, I'm, I'm still enjoying the heck out of this demo uh, as a free thing. Uh, it's not a full game, but like, like I said, like it brings me back to the the old 3D Mark days when I was excited every year to download that new the new benchmark. Like, I want this on PC so it can be run as a benchmark. So uh, you know, like right now we're, we're, I'm, I'm still using like Unigen and, and uh, I guess there are some, some modern games with, with uh, I think horizon uh, Forza horizon is a good benchmark. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, free on uh, PS five, Xbox series X and series S. I'm really want a PS five now. Like I want a PS five so I can run this on the PS five at a uh, slightly better quality than the Xbox. I have to run soon, my friend. All right. I think that does it then. It does it for the podcast. I really just want to talk with you about the Matrix stuff. Uh, we have more of, I think the finale of Hawkeye is next week. I don't know if we're going to record before or after Hawkeye. I, I, I thought okay. next, oh, you're right. Five is tonight. Yeah, yes. Five, wow. is, five is this week and six. Um, no spoilers. Uh, no spoilers, please, for, for Spider-Man No Way Home. Like I said, I don't have tickets just yet, but maybe life will find a way. I don't uh, Oh. Uh, for you, Eternals comes out January twelfth, so you, you'll be able to watch that when it comes out on Disney Plus, and we'll be able to talk talk about it after that. Uh, anything else you want to promote, Jeremy? Anything, anything you want to get a shout shout out to? Um, good cheer to all. That's all. I promote good cheer to all. Be kind all right. to your neighbor. <laughs> yes, be kind to your neighbor. That's that's I think a good uh, a good lesson for everyone. Uh, thanks to Kishore for kicking us off with an, an update on omicron with a moment of science and hopefully he'll be back next week with maybe some updates as well but until then here is an outro created by one of you out there thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next week hi there i didn't see you Pass it. what did you think when you saw me i thought it was stupid What? That was called Blunt Jeremy. That's a deep fake. I didn't say that to Kishore. Did I? (laughs) You know, deep fake audios are much better than deep fake videos these days. Luke in The Mandalorian Season 2, his audio completely artificially generated. No one knew. No one knew. All right. See you next time. Bye. Bye.